reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Daniel chapters 7 and 8, entitled Daniel's Visions. We're going to see the future from Daniel's perspective of the nation of Israel. Jesus said to his disciples before he died, when asked, how long will the Gentiles trample down Israel and Jerusalem? And Jesus responded that it would take place until the times of the Gentiles had been fulfilled. God was punishing Israel because of her idolatry and unfaithfulness, and he was going to use Gentile powers and nations to suppress and oppress her, to teach her to turn to him. God uses chastisement to correct us, even as we do that with our children. We have to chastise to correct. And so the Gentiles would have to be dominating over Israel until finally Jesus would come. And Daniel, in 539 BC, has a vision, actually has several visions of what's going to happen. He's going to have visions about the Gentile powers that are going to rule over Israel, that already were ruling over him during Daniel's time. It actually began in 538 BC when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians captured and destroyed much of the people of Jerusalem and Judea, took them into captivity in Babylon. And that would continue, and that oppression does continue even to this day, a different sort to be sure, but Gentiles are still strongly influential in Israel. Think about current events and how little power Israel really has over its own nation, fighting with the Palestinians, fighting in the United Nations, uh, fighting over where the capital is going to be, uh, their beloved city, Jerusalem, which is now shared by other peoples and, and Gentiles, they don't have the freedom and the peace, and they never will until Jesus returns. And so in this uh, brief uh, overview of these two chapters, we're going to see all the Gentile powers and what Daniel saw, which absolutely astounded him. What I take away from this uh, is the idea that God sees the future. Uh, right now, he's revealing in 539 B.C., and now we're, what, 2018? So what's that, 2,500 years ago? Uh, God revealed the future, and yet some of that future hasn't even taken place yet. The Lord might return tomorrow, and he might not return for a 1,000 years. And so God sees the whole timeline. Well, what does that do for me? Why don't I put my life in his hands? King David said, my life is like a tale that's been told. He already sees me being born at this moment, at my age. He sees me dead. He sees me around the throne. He sees it all. So let's go to God and say, Lord, whatever you want. As Mary said when they were filling the water pots and making them wine at the marriage feast of Cana, she said, whatever Jesus says to do, do it. And so you and I need to do the same thing. Lord, what can I do? You see the future. And uh, let's see this astounding vision, uh, beginning with uh, chapter 7. I'm going to do mostly reading because it's all self-explanatory. And you've got some notes here, and uh, I don't want to hear any heads thumping on the uh, pew in front of you here. And uh, we'll try to make it as interesting as we can. We have some nice pictures, too, to uh, give us a little more of a graphic idea of what's going on. But uh, let's bow our hearts and ask for God's help. Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word we ask you to help us to understand it and really be changed by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember now, our theme is 
Gentile ruling powers over Israel until Messiah comes in the millennium and rules and works through Israel to govern the world. Chapter 7 of Daniel, beginning in verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. See, God had given Daniel this ability to uh, interpret dreams, and now he's giving him a dream and the interpretation. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was very different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns." I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn were like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I watched then, because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching with the same horn, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings, who shall arise from his kingdom, 
and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. God has given to Daniel what he has given to nobody else in all the Bible, a timeline from the kingdom which took him into captivity, Babylon, to the next kingdom, the Medes and the Persians, to the next kingdom, Greece, to the next kingdom, Rome, to the final kingdom of the Antichrist until the coming of the Lord Jesus. We're talking about over 2,500 years of history, all known in advance by God. And now we see in your little handout, you've got some pictures here to make it easier. Uh, the first one, let's go back, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we already know what the answers are. Uh, the four great beasts are the four Gentile powers which will overpower and control Israel. And the first one in verse 4 of chapter 7 is like a lion. And you can see that on your picture. There's a lion. It has eagle's wings, which means it moves rapidly in conquering foes. Lifted up from the earth, made to stand on two feet like a man. That would be Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful ruler who brought Daniel into captivity and promoted Daniel to be really number two under him in all the kingdom. He had a man's heart. That was Nebuchadnezzar. And then in 539 B.C., the Medes and the Persians conquered Babylon. No kingdom lasts forever except for the Lord's, right? And so verse 5, another beast was like a bear. Look at your picture here of the bear. And um, the bear is raised up on its side. Uh, that means that one of the groups was stronger than the other. The Persians overpowered the Medes. Uh, it had three ribs in its mouth. These are three countries that it conquered. And you see all this in your notes. Uh, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. All this yet future, several hundred years in the future from Daniel's perspective. Uh, and it was told to devour and eat much flesh, meaning to conquer many people. Notice how we're getting to be, uh, these animals are getting more and more base. Kind of a picture of mankind without God getting more to be like animals every time. Uh, and then we find uh, there's a third one. Verse 6, this is like a leopard, has four wings of a bird. Uh, the, fourth, the, the third one is Greece, which then overpowers Persia under the mighty hand of perhaps the greatest general who ever lived, uh, and that would be uh, the, um, uh, Dan, uh, the um, Alexander the Great. He moved so quickly, it was like a leopard with wings on his back. Uh, he was able to conquer the Persian army. Uh, he was only in his early 30s, and he had 35,000 troops, and the Persians were over 300,000, more than 10 times as many. And uh, he realized that the Persians had these horrible uh, scythe attachments, the sword blades to their wheels of their chariots. And when they would come in, they would absolutely cut off the legs and arms and heads of, of the enemies. And so they uh, actually, the Persians spent a lot of time uh, getting the ground prepared. They actually mowed down some uh, rough areas and got it, everything smooth for those chariots. And here's Alexander, this young general from Greece, and he sees all these massive troops, and he sees these horrible uh, Scythian blades of these chariots, and so he realizes he needs to move the Persian army away from this flat ground where they have the advantage, and so he gets his troops to start moving to the right, and Persia begins to get sucked in and begins to get moving to the right. He moves them so far to the right 
that they're now on rough terrain and those chariots cannot move effectively. He also knows enough about warfare to realize that where the archers are is the weakest part of the enemy. That's why the archers are there. And so he moves them away from the smooth ground, attacks the, where the archers are, and in a matter of minutes, destroys the most powerful nation at that time. And Greece becomes the world power. A young man who uh, had uh, tremendous brilliance, but he got malaria, he got pneumonia, and he got drunk, and he died at the tender age. It was only about 32, 33 when he died. What happens after Alexander? A fight among the four generals. They fight about who is going to be the leader, and that's why we have the four uh, heads after Alexander, and you'll see those are the uh, four leaders uh, of the, um, uh, of the uh, different uh, factions of Greece. And um, they then are conquered by Rome. Uh, this is the fourth and terrible beast. And um, that's number, verse number seven. I saw in the night vision a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, huge iron teeth, more powerful than the others. Rome, uh, although it didn't have as extensive a geography, still had a tremendous hold on much of the world, mostly around the Mediterranean. And uh, it was different from all other beasts because it would have longevity. And actually, Rome was a very powerful nation until it finally... Uh, uh, it actually lasted into well over 400, BC, 400 AD, but finally was defeated. And um, uh, today we look at the Roman Empire and we say that it's not existing. Some think the Roman Catholic Church may be a part of it. Uh, that's arguable. But in any event, the Roman Kingdom has not yet been completed uh, because we look at those ten horns, verse 7. It has ten horns. Look at verse 8, uh, a little horn uh, pops up uh, before whom three of the first horns are plucked out. These ten horns are part of that old Roman Empire, and it's believed by many that we're talking here about the future, about the fourth beast ultimately uh, coming to give rise to the Antichrist. So these 10 nations, these 10 kings, as it says here, and Revelation 13 also talks uh, about uh, this beast and verifies the fact that it's going to have uh, these 10 kings. Uh, Revelation 13, 1, you don't need to turn to it. I stood on the sand of the sea. I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, seven heads, 10 horns, and on his horns, 10 crowns, and on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. That's the Antichrist. So this is how the Antichrist is going to come forth. He will come forth from one of the ten nations, the ten horns of the Roman Empire. Look at your map of the Roman Empire. You're looking basically at Europe around the Mediterranean, a little bit of North Africa, uh, on over into England, but basically around the Mediterranean. Today's language, if you were to pinpoint where those 10 nations are, you're talking about basically the European community. And those 10 nations are going to become powerful before the Lord's return. He says here that one horn is going to overpower three. So one of those horns is going to have a man whom John calls the Antichrist, that man is going to overpower three other nations in those ten nation confederation. He becomes the head of those, through those nations, and now he's going to get control of those ten uh, nation conglomerate uh, around the Mediterranean. He's now building his power base. We also know in other scriptures that he is starting to move to become very strong in the church, not the church of Jesus Christ. That's been taken out in the rapture, but the church without Christ after the rapture, the, uh, the uh, harlot of, Re of Revelation 17. And so this little horn, verse 8, uh, he has eyes like the eyes of a man. He speaks pompous words, arrogant, blasphemes God. He's getting ready to take over and rule the world. So this is all about the Antichrist, and you can read about that in Revelation. Well, it seems like he's going to win 
but God has the last word. Verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. That's the Father. He comes, he opens up uh, the books, he has a throne of fiery flame to make judgment, and then we find that he is going to deal with this pompous Antichrist who will only be powerful really for about three and a half years. And uh, verse 13, one like the Son of Man, that's Jesus Christ, he will come with the clouds of heaven, and he will come and he will be given the kingdom, the kingdom of God worldwide. Israel is going to now have their Messiah. Orthodox Jews are looking for the coming of the Messiah. In the area that I grew up in in Albany, there was a very Jewish concentration of Orthodox Jews. And I would see the bumper sticker, uh, Mashiach, or Messiah is coming. And I realized that I was one with those Orthodox Jews in that I'm looking for the same person. They're looking for the Messiah to come the first time. I'm looking for Jesus to come the second time. And so the, Jesus will come, he'll receive the kingdom, and Israel will have their Messiah. Well, now we see verse 15 interprets the whole thing, and we find that uh, uh, in the end, the kingdom is, verse 27, the kingdom, the dominion, the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven are given to the people, the saints of the Most High. And the kingdom of the Lord Jesus is an everlasting kingdom. Uh, now, that's uh, the account in chapter 7. Let's look at uh, chapter 8. Uh, he gets another vision two years later, a more specific vision, uh, which gives us an idea of uh, the expected Antichrist. There's somebody in history who is very much like the Antichrist. We look at that man and get a picture of what the Antichrist will be in the future. Chapter 8 of Daniel, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. I saw in the vision, and it happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, that would be modern day Iran, by the way. I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns. You know what a ram is, it's a male uncastrated sheep, beautiful horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And this would be the Medes and the Persians, and the Persians are the higher uh, ram uh, uh, horn because they became stronger. And the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. So that's the Medo-Persians taking the world over uh, at that time. And I was considering, and suddenly a male goat came from the west, from Greece, across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, lightning speed, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. That's Alexander the Great. He, his, his real strength was speed. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing by the river, and ran at him with furious power. I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground, trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male, gro the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the winds of heaven. And that's what we said was the uh, death of Alexander the Great, followed by the four generals. Uh, their names were, incidentally, from history, Ptolemy, who came out of Egypt, Cassander, Lysimachus, and then the most important one for us, Seleucus. Seleucus was given the area of Syria, uh, Israel, and Mesopotamia. So you see the picture here of of Greece coming and destroying Persia in lightning speed. And um, we're going to be looking really at somebody coming out of that line of Seleucus. That's more important. And um, he goes on to say in verse 11, he ex exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. By him the legal daily sacrifices were taken away. Um, 
and because of the transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, cast down uh, the truth. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said, that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So now we get the interpretation of that. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli who had called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Gabriel is one of the archangels of God assigned to the nation of Israel. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid. I fell on my face, but he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. This is going to be the end of Gentile power. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in deep sleep with my face to the ground. He touched me, stood me upright, and he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, the turning against God. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. The ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king, Alexander. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. And those are the four generals who would never be as strong as Alexander. Now, in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people, or Israel." Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, Jesus, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it." So we have this accounting once again of the fight between Alexander the Great and the Medo-Persian Empire. Alexander and the Greeks win. Alexander dies soon thereafter, and the four generals arise, and then from the four generals, Seleucus in particular will come one man who will be kind of a preview of the Antichrist. His name is Antiochus or Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. He came out of Syria and uh, he was wicked. And look, look at verse 23, in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, in other words, the Gentiles have done all they can to exercise their power over Israel. A king shall arise, that's Antiochus, having fierce features, understands sinister schemes. His power is going to be mighty, but not by his own power. There's going to be a satanic influence in his life. He shall destroy fearfully and prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he'll cause deceit to prosper under his rule. He'll exalt himself in his heart. He'll destroy many in their prosperity. Now, this is talking about this king out of Syria. And the last, uh, the back side of your page talks more about his name. He comes out of the line of Seleucus, the general. And uh, what happened, a little bit of history. Look, just type in the word Hanukkah, H-A-N-N-U-K-A-H, Hanukkah. The Jews still celebrate Hanukkah today with the nine candlestick menorah. And it's a very interesting story about what happened. It had to do with a church split. Do we know what that's all about? Jealousy of leadership, do we know what that's all about? 
Well, that happened in Israel. And what happened was there was a power struggle in the priesthood. And one group overpowered the other. And that was the Egyptian influence of the priests in Israel throughout the Hellenistic group, the more the Grecian group. And the Hellenistic group fled to Syria. That was the sons of Tobias. They then went to their leader, Antiochus Epiphanes, and said, help us to throw the other guys out. We've been thrown out, let's throw them out. And so whereas Antiochus's father, that was Antiochus III the Great, was benevolent toward the Jews and said, go ahead and worship and celebrate your customs, his son, Epiphanes, came in with an army and destroyed many of the people, ransacked the temple, sacrificed a pig right on the altar, set up an altar to Zeus in there, and desecrated the holy temple of God in Jerusalem. And so they have a nickname for him. They had a nickname called Antiochus the, 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 the pig, really. And he was just absolutely brutal, brutal to the nation of Israel. Well, a group arose from the house of Judas Maccabeus. And they said, we've had enough. And they overpowered the Syrian army still left, reclaimed the temple. And this is not in the Bible, but this is Jewish history. Your friends will be impressed if they're Jewish that you know this. They wanted to cleanse the temple for God. And they needed holy oil, pure oil. They searched and searched, and they only found one day's amount of oil. It would take eight days to create enough oil. They had to burn oil. They had to burn light at night in the temple. So how do you take one day's oil and stretch it eight more days? Can't do it. So somehow they prayed to God, and God took that one day of oil and multiplied it to two days, three days, four days, five days, six days, seven days. It lasted eight more days, and they were then able to keep the lights burning in the temple. That's why the Jews celebrate to this day Hanukkah with a nine branch. The first is the Shamas, which is the center branch from which they light the other eight candles. It's a nine candle menorah. It, the miracle of celebrating the nine days it took to get that oil uh, ready. And so Judas Maccabeus becomes a great hero in Israel for casting out this Antiochus and his horrible influence from Syria. But let's go back and look at those verses because going back to the previous chapter, this is also speaking about the future Antichrist, that little horn who's going to pop up somewhere in Europe and don't listen to anybody who tells you that the opposing political party head is the Antichrist or that Jerry Lynn is the Antichrist or somebody else. He's going to come out of Europe. He's going to be the head of a nation of Europe. He will take over at least two other nations, perhaps three, and he will then become the head of those ten nations and really the head of the church as well, the church without Jesus Christ. Well, this is also a picture of the Antichrist. And so he is, verse 23, um, it applies to him. He has fierce features. He understands sinister schemes. Um, he is going to, verse 25, through cunning deceit, prosper in his rule. He will exalt himself in his heart. He'll be destroyed, or he'll destroy many in their prosperity. He, according to Revelation, is going to come alongside of Israel. You know, putting some prophecy in from Ezekiel, what's going to happen, just a couple more minutes and we're going to close. What's going to happen is after the church is taken away in what is known as the rapture. And if you don't give your heart to Jesus, dear friend, you're going to stay. And I urge you this morning, give your heart to Christ and ask him to receive you into his heart. And when he comes to take you with him, because then you'll be out of the way for this tribulation that's about to take place. Because the tribulation is Jesus' wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. I don't want to see anybody left behind. I want you all up there in heaven. And so give your hearts to Christ because when that church goes, those who love him, individual Jews and Gentiles will go with him. The earth then will be left with those who reject Christ. They'll build their own church without Jesus. And this 10 nation confederation is going to become strong under this one man, Antichrist. He's going to demand that you take his mark 
of 666 or his name. It's going to be uh, maybe a chip on your hand or who knows what it's going to be. But he is going to then be the master ruler and you'll have to worship him. He's going to come alongside Israel. He's going to be their friend. He's going to help them build a temple and to protect their borders. And then halfway into the seven-year tribulation time with the church in heaven, halfway into it, he marches in, according to Revelation, he goes into the temple, has an image of himself set up, and says, I am God, worship me. The Jews say no. The Jews are taught not to worship a man. And parenthetically, for extra credit, why do your Jewish friends reject Jesus Christ? Because he is a man. He's also God. But they can't make that jump. It's going to take an act of faith. But understand them. They've been taught not to accept a man as God. And Jesus is a man as well as God. Anyway, they're going to reject the Antichrist. He's going to turn with wrath and come against them like Antiochus Epiphanes did. He's going to destroy many of them as well as Gentiles. Anybody not serving the Antichrist will be put to death. But the Lord's going to hide some of them. And uh, by the time they have had three and a half years of this horrible uh, rule, then finally, Revelation 19 says that you and I are coming back with Jesus uh, on our white horses. I got to learn how to ride horseback before then somehow. And we're going to come back and we're going to then see the destruction of the Antichrist at Armageddon. What happens is that the nations begin to rebel against him. His popularity is high in the beginning, but because of ruthless rule, it is to the point where he wants to still hold on with sheer power and many nations rise against him. And we're going to see huge armies coming in from the east, China, Japan, Africa, Ethiopia, and other nations, uh, the north, Russia, and all of those. They're going to come against the Antichrist and European forces behind him. They're going to meet at Armageddon. There's going to be a bloodbath there like the world has never known. And you and I, Revelation 19, are going to come back, and without human means, just one word from Jesus' mouth is going to destroy the Antichrist uh, influence and uh, destroy many of his followers. And you and I are then going to enter into what is known as the millennium, the time of peace, and the Lord Jesus is going to rule in Jerusalem. The United Nations will have nothing to say about where the capital is and, and who is going on. Israel will be supreme. And it's going to be the jewel in his crown. The time of the, end, uh, the Gentiles will then be ended. So we've gone on a timeline of over 2,500 years here. That's the future. Uh, so what? Well, so what is uh, I want to be with Jesus. I don't want to go uh, under the influence of the Antichrist. I don't want to see the world under his reign. And so this may be a good chance for us to examine our hearts to see, do I know the Lord? Um, I know Jesus Christ exists. I've heard about him. Uh, I've been on construction jobs and I've hit my th hammer on, on my thumb and I've mentioned his name a time or two, but uh, uh, I, I want to know him. I want to love him and I want, I want his help. Uh, the Bible says he died for my sins. Yeah, he came and he bore my sins as well as my sicknesses and my sorrows. He loves me. He wants to take me to the kingdom. But he said, in order to get there, you have to receive me into your heart. Revelation 3 says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock and I want to come in. I want to be your, your God. I want to be your Savior. Would you invite me in? Would you allow me to come? And if you do that, when you come into my Father's kingdom, because you confessed me before men and women, I'm going to confess you before my Father. But if you reject me, then I can't, I can't bring you into my home. Then you'll be involved in all this nonsense down here. So it's a good chance for us to bow our hearts right now. And uh, I'm going to ask for you, and you know, just, uh, just in the privacy, nobody's watching, but just between you and the Lord, and I'll be watching just to, to uh, be confirming, if you've never given your heart to Christ, uh, or you've given your heart before, but you're not where you want to be spiritually, you want to come back, and you're like that prodigal son or daughter who went down the road, and you just were not worshiping God, we're not fellowshipping, but you want to come home. Now's the time to do it. I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up. The Lord's going to see it, and I'm going to see it. We want to see you saved. Okay, I see that hand. That's good. I see another hand. Praise the Lord. Is there anybody else? I see those hands. Excellent. Thank you, Jesus. You want to come back home. You want to give your heart to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Jesus. Father, you see those hands. We ask now, Lord God, that you'll help them to come into your kingdom as they open their hearts to you. Lord Jesus, save their souls. Forgive them for the sins that they've committed. Forgive us all because we're all sinners. And Lord, cleanse us and wash us and fill us with your joy and fill us with your peace and fill us with your love. And thank you, Lord, that when you come, we're going up with you. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen and amen. Reach out.